Are you struggling with those tiny rough bumps on the backs of your arms? Maybe even your thighs. They don't necessarily itch, but whatever you do, they don't seem to go away. Well, you're in the right video because today we're gonna be talking about rough and bumpy skin, otherwise known as keratosis pilaris, tends to crop up on the backs of the arms. I'm going to be going over what causes this, how to control it. We're even gonna touch on diet and what foods you should be focusing on to tackle the rough and bumpy skin once and for all. Keratosis pilaris is commonly referred to as KP or chicken skin or strawberry skin. It's a harmless skin condition, but it's really frustrating to deal with. And as you may have become aware at this point, if you're dealing with it, it really does not go away once and for all. You need to stay on top of a regimen to control it, which we're gonna be talking about today. What exactly is happening that is leading to these rough bumps, often, often on a base of redness, hence the name strawberry skin. Well, this is caused by a buildup of keratin, a protein that constitutes the bulk of our skin. It builds up around the hair follicle as a result of dry skin and just your background makeup. You have a tendency for the skin to turn over maybe a little bit more slowly and as a result, get kind of stuck together and lead to the formation of dry skin, rough bumps, buildup of dry, rough skin texture. Not only can it affect the upper arms, but it can appear on the thighs, the buttocks, as well as the face. As a side note, if you deal with this on the face, watch my video on how to get rid of it on your face because there are some specific facial recommendations that we're not talking about in this video. We're only talking about body KP, like on the arms and the thighs. It's not an infection, it's not contagious, it's not a food allergy, and it has nothing to do with your hygiene. But there are things you can do in your skincare routine to make it better, to make it clear up, and to control it. Some people get it because, well, it's likely genetic. If you have the condition known as atopic dermatitis, congratulations, you're more likely to have keratosis pilaris. If you deal with dry skin in general, you are more likely because this, at its root, is a dry skin condition. There is some evidence that some people who develop insulin resistance also end up with more stubborn keratosis pilaris probably as it relates to the impact of insulin resistance on the skin overall. And check out my video on how having insulin resistance and diabetes impacts your skin health. Your eyes will be opened. Keratosis pilaris often flares up in the colder winter months, especially when people have their heaters turned on and the ambient humidity drops. This leads to more water loss from the skin in general. Our skin has a greater tendency to become drier. So it makes perfect sense that the dry skin condition, keratosis pilaris, will would get worse. Here's something I wanna emphasize though. Keratosis pilaris, it's a chronic skin condition. There's not a cure for it. Some people outgrow it and don't deal with it ever again, but for the most part, it's one of those things that tends to come and go, rear its head, and therefore having a maintenance routine that you stick with is key. So the goal is not to cure it, it's to manage it. So how can you treat keratosis pilaris and get it under good control? The first step is some sort of exfoliation to exfoliate away those dry, rough bumps. But you need to take a conservative approach. Over exfoliating, exfoliating too frequently, it can worsen the condition because it can impair barrier function because you've been overdoing it. You get more water loss and more flare-ups of KP. One of my favorite ingredients to exfoliate away the dry, rough bumps is urea. Look for body creams and lotions with urea. Not only is it exfoliating, but it also hydrates the skin. Alternative look for alpha hydroxy acids, ammonium lactate, which is the salt of lactic acid, glycolic acid, mandelic acid. There are so many fantastic body lotions with these ingredients, such as amlactin. Also look for the ingredient salicylic acid, which is an acne treatment, but it helps dissolve those little rough bumps. Apply moisturizers with these ingredients daily if you so tolerate them. But when I said be mindful of your exfoliating, be aware of other things that you might be doing that also exfoliate the skin at the same time and adjust accordingly. For example, if you shave your upper arm, shaving is mechanical exfoliation. So shaving, especially if you press really hard, followed by an exfoliant, that's a lot. It can dry out your skin. Also just bathing in general using a washcloth does offer some mechanical exfoliation. So you wanna be mindful that you are not scrubbing, scrubbing, scrubbing. You use a gentle hand because the mechanical exfoliation coupled with the chemical exfoliation and the moisture 
moisturizer, it might be too much. You really want to look into rich body moisturizers that have barrier supporting ingredients like ceramides. For example, these are lipids naturally found in skin's outermost layer. And in dry skin conditions like keratosis pilaris, atopic dermatitis, they may be a little deficient and applying them in the form of a body lotion can help your body say, hey, I should make more of these. Also, moisturizers just help to reduce transepidermal water loss, which ultimately is going to be a game changer by improving water content in skin's outermost layer. Those natural turnover processes can go a lot more efficiently, a lot more smoothly, reducing the formation of those dry, rough bumps, and also ultimately reducing inflammation in the skin as a result of increased water loss reduces that. So you get improvement in the stubborn redness that surrounds the dry, rough bump. Look for petrolatum, shea butter, dimethicone. These help really seal water into the skin, reducing transepidermal water loss and improving the condition further. In the description box, I will link some of my go-to body moisturizers. There are many. Choose the one that you like the best and that you're going to stay consistent using. It's likely going to be the one that works the best because these things only work if you use them. But let's talk about your shower routine. This can make or break your keratosis pilaris. You want to make sure that you take lukewarm showers. I, as much as I love a hot shower, hot showers, especially of a long duration, are notorious, notorious for drying out the skin and can aggravate and worsen keratosis pilaris. Use gentle fragrance-free body washes and again, a light hand and soft circular motions with a washcloth. It can dislodge those dry rough bumps, but don't press aggressively because that can further dry out your skin. After you rinse the skin and you step out of the shower, pad dry the skin gently. Don't rub that towel back and forth. That's more mechanical exfoliation that can dry out your skin. These little habits by themselves, they don't really make a huge noticeable difference right away, but they add up and they can really move the dial even further in controlling the rough and bumpy skin. The other thing I always recommend when it comes to any dry skin condition, but especially keratosis pilaris, and especially if you live in a dry climate, is consider having a humidifier in the bedroom that you run at night. The air tends to be drier at night. Our skin at baseline loses more water at night. Having a humidifier running in the bedroom as you sleep, it can get ahead of the transepidermal water loss issue by reducing the impetus for water to exit your skin and ultimately can move the dial even further in controlling the KP flare-ups. Let's talk more advanced treatments, specifically topical retinoids. Your dermatologist could prescribe a prescription retinoid such as tazeratine, triferritine, tretinoin, or adapalene, which as a side note is also over the counter here in the US. It's an acne treatment, but it falls in this category. These medications, they're acne treatments, but they also can help improve the turnover processes of the skin barrier, ultimately helping cut down on the formation of dry, rough, bumpy skin. And they also can improve the production of barrier components. Ultimately, that makes for a healthier skin barrier, less transepidermal water loss, fewer flare-ups. So they can be very effective for keratosis pilaris. They're a go-to actually that many dermatologists lean on when patients come to them seeking treatment for keratosis pilaris. However, they do have a bit of a learning curve. They often cause some dryness, irritation, and peeling in the first few weeks as your skin is getting accustomed to the ingredient. Now, alternatively, you might elect to use a cosmetic retinol body lotion or a retinaldehyde that you can buy without a prescription. These are cosmetics. They work similar, a little bit more slowly, but they likewise can be effective. And if you've been watching my channel for any number of years, you know a favorite body retinol lotion that happens to be very helpful for my keratosis pilaris. I frequently recommend it. It's the Gold Bond Age Renew Retinol Body Lotion. Not only does it have retinol, but it also has urea. That's that other ingredient that hydrates and gently exfoliates. Really, really helpful as maintenance. Doesn't cure it, but helps maintain it. Now here's something I want to touch on because anytime I talk about keratosis pilaris, I'm bound to get a question about this. And that is, does laser hair removal help get rid of keratosis pilaris? The answer is it can. It can actually help cut down on keratosis pilaris. However, it doesn't cure it. And you need to keep in mind that we don't have robust clinical data on the use of laser hair removal as a treatment intervention for keratosis pilaris. It's difficult to predict not only will it work, but how long will those results be maintained since it is a chronic skin condition. But by reducing the rate of hair growth, it ultimately can help cut down on the trapping of dry rough skin around the follicle. And the laser can also help to 
target the redness. So it definitely can lead to an improvement, at least in the appearance of keratosis pilaris. Just be aware of the fact that it doesn't necessarily cure it and you likely still will need to do these maintenance treatments. And it's expensive too. But let's talk about diet because this is another area where a lot of people want more information on what types of foods can help, can harm. Is there any association with any foods? Again, the research here is pretty limited, but some people do notice improvements in their skin when they reduce refined ultra processed sugary foods, because again, those can be associated with insulin resistance, which is associated with more stubborn keratosis pilaris. So it makes sense. And it's just good for your health to not overly rely on processed sugary foods. It's okay as a little treat, but you don't want your meals to consist of those types of foods. And I have videos on what those types of foods look like if you're wanting more information. You also want to make sure that you are getting healthy fats in your diets. Omega-3 fatty acids, for example, are very helpful in skin hydration and ultimately can play a role in keeping the KP in check. Sources include flaxseed, walnuts, chia seeds, fatty fish. A well-balanced diet will supply nutrients that are also very important for proper skin health and skin barrier turnover. These include vitamin A, vitamin D, as well as antioxidants. What about gluten? There's no evidence that gluten causes keratosis pilaris or worsens it, or that avoiding gluten will get rid of keratosis pilaris. There is a specific skin condition where gluten must be avoided at all costs. It's known as dermatitis herpetiformis. You get these little itchy rashes. That condition is not the same as keratosis pilaris. It is a gluten sensitive enteropathy adjacent under the same umbrella as celiac disease. Patients with celiac disease or dermatitis herpetiformis, they absolutely must avoid gluten, go on a gluten-free diet. When they introduce gluten, they get very ill, their skin is aggravated. But if you don't have either of those conditions and you have keratosis pilaris, eliminating gluten is unlikely to be a game changer. And anyone telling you otherwise, that may just be their personal anecdote, but we need more research to really back that up because it's a pretty big lifestyle change to ask people to do without adequate research to back it up. When should you see a dermatologist for your keratosis pilaris? You know, a lot of people don't even think about seeing a dermatologist for keratosis pilaris because they just view it as maybe like a cosmetic concern, but it is a medical skin condition. And if your skin is not improving after six to eight weeks of using over-the-counter moisturizers, over-the-counter uh, keratolytics like glycolic acid, lactic acid, mandelic acid, urea, salicylic acid, you've stayed consistent, you've moisturized, you've modified your shower, routine and things are still not improving, see a dermatologist because a prescription retinoid might just be what gets you over the hump and they may be able to prescribe a compounded cream that has strong concentrations of some of these ingredients and that may get you just what you need as far as clearing up and controlling the condition. It's harmless but it's frustrating but the good news is there are things that you can do at home to keep it under control. I really hope this video was helpful to you guys. Now on the end slate I'm going to to put my recent video all about things that dermatologists do not do to their skin. So check that one out next if you missed it. But if you guys like this video, give it a thumbs up, share it with your friends. And as always, don't forget sunscreen and subscribe. I'll talk to you guys tomorrow. Bye. Mm -hmm.